tonight, police are searching for two people who opened fire outside a Metro East apartment complex. That breaking news right off the top is out of Sunset Hills. Within the last two hours, News 4 has confirmed the major case squad is now investigating the death of a woman. This quick trip was one of the hardest hit businesses last August, but today the Urban League will begin transforming the site into an empowerment center. News 4's Mike Colombo is live there this morning with the Bomberito Street Fleet. Good morning to you, Mike. The hope here is that sometime tonight he will step in front of that podium as the next and the new governor. Police Chief Sam Dodson says he was ambushed. He was targeted by four individuals. They started firing at him while he was seated in his car in full uniform. He was hit in the torso, but that officer was able to return fire. It's unclear if one of those suspects were hit. When I first looked at this sheet, it just made me so frustrated that once again, here we are standing here telling you how violent it is in the city of St. Louis. 20 people were killed in the month of April. That officer took a bullet right here in the shoulder, one that went through his body. It ended up exiting right out of his back. He really put it in terms that a lot of our TV viewers can understand. He called it the CSI effect. You have to look across the parking lot up into that tree to find the other part of the roof. And when you walk around to the back side of the building, it looks like a wrecking ball was right over this business and drop while you were talking to officers. You and police start to hear shots being fired. You know it's a crazy situation. Firefighters are not able to make their way out there. But as we go to the next business over, I want you to check this out. This is the O'Reilly Auto Park. From the math right here, that comes out to $22,600,898. That price tag is for police protection. Keep in mind that bullets do ricochet, and that is when we said, uh-uh, we're out of here. And look at all the damage they have done. You see T-shirts shirts and skirts and racks all knocked over glass all over here. Check it out. You see legs of mannequins just tossed about. We really wanted to bring you a firsthand account of what it was like to be in the middle of all of this overnight. So News 4's Laura Hedegar started working at 8 o'clock last night. She's the only morning reporter who really spent a lot of her night on the streets in Ferguson among the crowds of people. Laura kicks off our team coverage this morning live in Ferguson. Laura. And Claire, it was really an eye-opening night for me because when I got to that protest, I was expecting to see so many of the images. Many of our viewers have grown accustomed to seeing this week police in tactical gear, violent riots, and really mass confusion. From what I saw, though, that was not the case. You see, ain't nobody out here fighting. Right. Everybody's out here for Michael Brown. Everybody's kind of running around doing their own thing, but they're not angry. Last night they were angry and they were ready to just, they are ready to fight. From fighting on Wednesday to a sense of freedom on Thursday. I thought it was going to be violent. I thought I expected police officers. I expected like it was the night before, but it's not like that. It's much more peaceful. A parade of cars, loud honking and large crowds at night might not seem all that peaceful to you, but it sure is to all of these folks in Ferguson. The protesters are the ones that are keeping the peace, that are controlling traffic, and that's how it should be done. In the entire three and a half hours I reported through the protest, there was only one moment that I and everyone else I talked to was scared. We just so happened to catch it on camera. I live in Greenville now, and I work in Kirkwood. Three distinctive pops sound so familiar to so many in this area. Luckily, turned out to be a false alarm. No firecrackers, everybody. Protesters tell us that they are sorry about the looting and the damage to all the businesses, but they also say the only reason all this is able to happen is because of a change in the way Ferguson is being policed. People were just saying thanks for allowing us to uh, uh, speak and without uh, fear of tear gas and some of those things. And, and so, uh, and I want them to speak and, and I want to hear what they say, but I also ask them we have to do it in a peaceful way. That is Captain Ron Johnson, now the man in charge of all of this, and he's going to have a busy day. Why? Because county police just told me there were five incidents overnight in which they could not respond.
New initiative in St. Louis. It is aimed at improving how murder cases are prosecuted. This new method of processing crime scenes has been happening over the past month. Laura Hedegar sat down with the circuit attorney and commander of the Homicide Division to ask if the procedural difference will make a difference. We don't want to take any homicides, uh, but the ones that we do take, we want to make sure that we give each one all the attention that we can give to it. And having so many makes it more difficult. Captain Michael Sack has a difficult job. He's investigated nearly every one of the city's 64 homicides this year. That's nothing new, but who he sees at those crime scenes is. No matter the time of day, prosecutors are now coming right to the scene. Once everything's stable and all the evidence has been identified, uh, the attorney will be allowed in. A month ago, homicide detectives would go to a scene, then they would come back here to write up their report. Then they would go a couple of blocks away to hear the Carnahan Courthouse to give that report to prosecutors, and then police would pretty much wait. Now the only waiting is done by prosecutors waiting to get a phone call from St. Louis City Police so both sides can start working that investigation together. I think the police have been frustrated that, uh, at the amount of cases that they been able to carry through to a successful prosecution and we realized after talking with others around the country that we could really impact that if we were right there with the detectives in the middle of the night at the crime scene when a homicide occurs. Jennifer Joyce explains as police collect evidence to solve the crime, her attorneys are there to make sure the evidence will hold up in court. Both sides say the combined approach will speed up the entire homicide investigation prosecution process. I think it can take out days and even more importantly, I think it can result in cases being prosecuted where before we would not have prosecuted those cases. And that's something they hope will help to end violence, STL. Laura Hedegar, News 4. More education news new this morning as another school year comes to an end. It's also the end of an era in Edwardsville, Illinois, the Ed Hightower era. Our Laura Hedegar spoke with the longtime superintendent yesterday. She's live in Edwardsville with that story. Good morning, Laura. Good morning to you, Andre. Kids are just getting to Edwardsville High School right now. Many of them have book bags on. Of course, books will be in those book bags, but check out the book I am holding. It is called The Whistleblower, and it is about the man who for years has been in charge of making sure all the kids who go to this school district get a proper public school education. I had a chance to speak with Dr. Ed Hightower at length yesterday, and he will blow his final whistle here at the end of June wrapping up 40 years in public education, 21 years in Alton, the final 19 here in Edwardsville as superintendent. He found the time during all of that to become a legendary college basketball referee and oh yeah, raise a family. But for a man who has made two careers of constantly making decisions, this is the way he says he's lived his life. The one thing I can go to bed at night and say, any decision that I ever made, I made it in the best interests of the kids, of the children that I was entrusted to provide that safe and nurturing environment for. Dr. Hightower will give his final graduation speech on Saturday, and he actually gave me a copy of it. I've read it, of course, like any good book. I really picked up on the ending. I don't think I'm giving too much away when Dr. Hightower encourages the class of 2015 to go out and make a difference in their community and in their country. I think most would agree that Dr. Hightower has done just that. Reporting live in Edwardsville, Laura Hedegaard, News 4.